Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Ali. I'm a doctor based in the UK, and this is a review of the brand new Apple 2020 M1 MacBook Air. And because, as you guys know, I'm a huge fan of upfront conclusions, I'm just going to tell you upfront. I think this laptop is basically as close to perfect as an entry-level laptop can be. The early 2020 version of the MacBook Air was nearly there. It was nearly the perfect laptop. And even then I said that if anyone is in the market for a laptop and you can afford a MacBook and you want a MacBook, you should just go for the MacBook Air. That one had issues with thermal performance and fan noise and overheating and stuff. This one has none of those issues. This laptop is absolutely sick. And in the rest of the review, I'm going to try and justify why I think this laptop is absolutely sick and why it's pretty much a no brainer if you're in the market for a reasonably priced MacBook, look no further than this, this is the one. So if you've got $1,000 that you wanna spend on a laptop or 900 if you're a student, because you can get this on student discount, then you might as well just buy it. I'll put a link in the video description for whatever that's worth. <laughs> um, and you can just buy it and you can turn this video off and do something better with your time. But if you're interested in the full review, that's what I'm gonna be talking about now. Let's start by talking about the processor. And this is the big news. Now, in the past, Apple has been using Intel based processors, but now, as of like this week, they have switched some of their laptops, the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, and the Mac Mini, reviews on those coming shortly. They switched all of those to their own internally designed Apple Silicon M1 chip. Now this means that the processor is similar to what you get in iPhones and iPads, i.e. it's really, really, really fast. And it's very like ridiculously well optimized for Apple hardware because now Apple makes the software, they make the hardware and they make the processor as well. And that means that you just get ridiculous levels of performance and you get this always on thing. So as soon as you open the device, it just turns on kind of like you would expect with an iPhone. Let's talk about numbers now. So when it comes to the Apple designed processors, like on the iPhone, the iPad and the Apple Watch, they don't really talk about processor speed and clock speed and all of that stuff that you hear the Android phone manufacturers talking about because Apple just kind of A, they don't care and B, they like to show they don't care and C, it, it really doesn't matter what the numbers are because everything is so tightly integrated. In the past with the Intel based chips, they, they were talking about processors. They were saying, hey, this is a Intel Core i9, 3.2 gigahertz overclocked to blah, 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 eight core processor, like whatever. Now they're just calling it the M1 processor because no one really cares about the numbers. But if you do care about the numbers, and I have now started caring about the numbers because I'm trying to be a better tech reviewer, you can look to benchmarks like the Geekbench score, and that gives you an idea of how, like the numbers of how well the processor is performing. So let's take a look at those. Now here is what the Geekbench scores look like. So if we look at single core performance, you see the MacBook Pro, the Mac Mini, and the MacBook Air, the M1 versions are absolutely miles ahead of everything else. Even the mid 2020, you know, the one that just came out, Intel Core i9, 3.6 gigahertz, 10 core processor on the iMac is, like 25% slower than these new M1 chips that are on this $900 MacBook Air if you're a student. This level of performance is absolutely insane. If you're a normal person using this laptop, even if you're even if you're a pro kind of using this laptop, you are very, very, very unlikely to have any issues with performance just because of how fast these processors are. Secondly, let's have a look at multi-core performance. And now, you know, we've got the super fancy Mac Pros, which cost like $50,000, the Intel Xeon, blah, blah, blah. But if we look down, um, this is the Mac Mini with the M1. And these are the M1 processors. So they're in the 7,200 to 7,400 range. And all of these other ones are like very, very expensive. But this tiny cheap laptop here is faster in multi-core performance than the 16 inch MacBook Pro, which came with the Intel i9 processors with, with, with eight cores that only came out last year. That's a huge beast of a laptop. This is a MacBook Pro, 15 inch MacBook Pro from 2018. This has been my driver that's driving this whole setup with like four Thunderbolt ports and all, all of the stuff going on since 2018 and I haven't needed to upgrade this because it was fast enough. I did not need to upgrade to the 2018 or the 2019 or the 2020 versions. And this is so much faster than this in terms of just the raw geek range scores. And so when it comes to buying a laptop, this is ridiculously cheap now. Like for the amount of performance you get, you're not gonna have a problem with processor speed. Secondly, let's talk about thermal performance. Now this MacBook Air famously does not have a fan. And with the previous MacBook Air, the, the one in early 2020, which I called my favorite laptop at the time, that had enormous issues with with overheating. If you did a few different things, it would get really hot and it would start to make a huge noise because that had a fan. And if you were like sitting on a sofa with it in your lap, which I do a lot, then my jeans were getting really, really hot. And I would on, I would always think like I've wet myself because this thing was just getting so hot on my jeans. This I've had like literally, literally zero issues with it. It does not have a fan. It doesn't even need a fan because this processor is so efficient. And so I, you know, the sort of stuff that I use a computer for is Chrome, Notion, Spotify, Slack. Very occasionally I'll use Final Cut because I don't really edit my own videos anymore. But like it's fairly basic computing needs. Even though I'm a massive nerd, I don't really use any apps that stretch it that much. But even with like 20 tabs on Chrome Open and Slack and Spotify and, and a Zoom call, this 
was not even like, it was not even coming close to getting hot it was that efficient the only context in which this might be a problem is if you are using very very intensive apps in which case you might want to go for the macbook pro instead because that has a fan and so theoretically it will have less thermal throttling at those higher levels of performance but for most people including me you don't really need those high levels of performance and so the macbook air is absolutely perfect final thing about the processor is the idea of app compatibility now because apple have designed these processors the way that programmers apparently design their software is that it is optimized for specific architectures of processor. So all of the apps previously that were running on MacBooks were optimized for Intel x86 based processors. Who knows what that means, but that's what they were optimized for. Now, some of the apps and all of the Apple designed ones are very well optimized for the new M1 chip. So all everything that Apple makes like Safari and Final Cut and the Photos app and messages and most of the stuff you would need to use is perfectly optimized for this. But if you're the sort of person who uses lots of third-party software, a lot of products in the Adobe suite, for example, are not yet perfectly optimized. They're gonna become optimized very soon and apparently a version of Photoshop that's fully optimized is coming out early next year. But in the meantime, you are running slightly suboptimal performance versions of those. I don't really use any of those personally. I haven't tested them myself, but based on what other reviewers are saying, even the unoptimized versions of Premiere Pro and Photoshop still work completely fine. And so the only circumstance in which you, you should worry about app compatibility is if you, for your personal workflow, you're using like a really, really niche app, which might not yet be updated. And so before you go buy one of these or one of the new M1 chips, what I'd recommend is that you do a Google or you search on YouTube and you see whether your app has been updated and it's compatible with this chip. For 99% of people watching this video, you are not gonna have any issues at all. Moving on from processor, let's talk about the other things that are important about this. So firstly, the design. It's great, it's very light. I'll put the weight over here once I've had a chance to stick this on my scales. In fact, you know what, I'm gonna do that right now. Oh, 1,262 grams, and I'm not gonna say that in pounds and ounces because I'm not a heathen. Uh, 1,262 grams, 1 1.2 kilograms. This is, this is very light. In fact, this is my 12.9 inch iPad Pro with Magic Keyboard. Oh, 1366. This friggin' MacBook Air for $900 if you're a student is lighter and cheaper than this setup, which costs overall like 1,300 or 1,400 pounds and is actually heavier. Like that is, that's pretty cool. So 1,200 grams, let's get this out of the way. Design-wise, it's got two ports. We'll talk more about that later. And it's the same kind of wedge design that you have grown to love. Um, they haven't really updated the design at all. Everything is basically the same from the previous versions of the MacBook Air, which is fine because this is, this is actually great. The only slight beef I have with it is that I wish the bezels around the screen were a little bit less thick. You can kind of notice them. And in some modern Windows laptops, they don't have any bezels at all, but hopefully they'll update that for the next time. Let's now do my favorite part, which is the test of the keyboard. And I'm going to do a typing test on 10 fast fingers. Let's see what my typing speed on this keyboard is. Isn't this fun? Ooh, they've changed their design. Hello. All right, let's do it. Oh, legit, I have beaten my record on this. Previously, my record was 156 words per minute. This is 159 words per minute. I wanna get this on camera. Look at that. 159 words per minute on this new 2020 M1 MacBook Air. Uh, the keyboard in fairness is exactly the same as it was last time, but clearly my typing speed is slightly improved. This is a good keyboard. This is sick. ka -ching. I can update my uh, how I type really fast for you to say 159 words per minute now. That's very exciting. But yeah, overall, this keyboard is great. I really like the fact that it has an escape key. And this is like one annoying thing about the MacBook Pro line, that it has that crappy touch bar. Um, over here, there is a touch ID button, uh, which can lock the computer as well. And they've got the function keys at the top that let you increase brightness, do funky stuff. I don't really use the function keys for a lot. Uh, I, it, it is nice to have them for like play, fast forward, rewind on Spotify. And the escape key is really helpful. But yeah, this is an absolutely fantastic keyboard. No complaints, favorite keyboard of all time. Yeah, it's just the new Apple keyboard model. So after that flex of typing speed, let's now talk about battery life, which is probably more important than the keyboard because battery life is another area in which this machine has made absolute gains over the previous models. Now, Apple are advertising that you can get like 15 to 17 hours of video playback slash web browsing on this new MacBook Air and another two hours on top of that on the MacBook Pro, which has a slightly bigger battery. And this is absolutely insane. This is like at least a 50% increase over previous generations. And I've done a lot of browsing the web for these battery tests. And basically everyone is saying that Guys, when you look at the battery behind this thing, like the battery size itself has not changed compared to the previous models. But because this new Apple designed M1 chip is very, very, very efficient at using the battery, it just does really well in terms of battery life. Now, if this was the only thing that was improved with this generation of the MacBook Air, 
or the MacBook Pro, I would have upgraded because I think an extra 50% to 100% battery life is worth it. Because now with this MacBook, I have to carry around a charger everywhere I go. And because of the battery life improvements in this thing, it means I, that I actually don't need to carry a charger around. And this is a significant quality of life improvement for me and my shoulders and my back. So basically zero complaints on the battery life front, but actually the battery is one of the reasons why I'm probably gonna go for the MacBook Pro rather than this MacBook Air, because for an extra $300, I'm getting an extra two hours of battery life, which is useful day to day. But if you're the sort of person who buys one of these and has them for a very, very long time, like my housemate has been using her MacBook Air for five years. My old housemate has been using her laptop for eight years. If you're using a laptop for a very extended amount of time, over time, the battery gets less and less good. And so if you're buying a laptop to have for the long run, then you might want to buy the MacBook Pro instead, which has for $300 a slightly better battery. And therefore you're going to have slightly better battery life overall throughout the life of the machine. Next, let's talk about the trackpad, which as usual is best in class. I have used so many trackpads over the year. And every time I go to a computer shop, I try out trackpads and there's just nothing. There's just nothing that is as nice as one of these trackpads. These haven't really changed a lot apart from adding force touch. Uh, and like haptic feedback. They haven't really changed a lot since like 2012, 2011, which is good because it's a perfect trackpad. I can't imagine a trackpad being better than these ones. I really sound like an Apple fanboy in this review, but these laptops are amazing and they've just made them even more amazing with the M1 chip and it costs exactly the same, which is just next level. Moving on to the display, it is exactly the same as it's been recently. It's a high definition, high resolution retina display, 2560 by 1600 pixels, and it has 400 nits of brightness. What does that mean? Well, 400 nits of brightness, you know, it's at its maximum point. It's reasonable, but not super bright. The MacBook Pro has 500 nits of brightness, so it's 25% brighter. 400 nits is pretty good for most people in most circumstances. But for example, if you're on the beach or you're trying to work outside in the garden and there is a lot of sunlight, you might struggle to see something on a 400 nit brightness screen. If that's something that you really care about, you might want to go for the MacBook Pro instead. This is something I do actually care about, which is why I'm probably going to go for the MacBook Pro rather than the MacBook Air. But it is what it is. Let's talk about ports now. So we have two USB 3 slash 4 slash Thunderbolt ports over here, uh, and you have a headphone jack on the other side. This is a little bit annoying. It would be nice if they had more than two ports because, you know, one, two, three, four, I'm using all four ports on my 2018 15 inch MacBook Pro to connect to my big display and the eGPU and all this other kind of stuff. It would be nice if they had more ports. Now, for most people, two ports is absolutely fine, especially given the improved battery life. You probably aren't going to need to lug around a charger with you if you're taking this out for the day. And therefore, you probably won't need to have a charger permanently plugged in at all times like I have to do with old laptops. And of course, because they're USB-C slash Thunderbolt, uh, you're going to need a dongle if you still have old USB-A devices. Most of my stuff these days is now USB-C anyway, so this is absolutely fine. Two ports is reasonable, but if you need more, you probably don't want to go for one of these. Let's talk about the microphone and the camera all in one. Now this has pretty standard microphone features on it. And so I'm going to film a video using Photo Booth and you'll see that this is what the microphone on the MacBook sounds like. And this is what my proper $500 audio setup thing sounds like. And now going back to the MacBook Pro, this is what it's like. And if I look at the camera, it's still this really annoyingly bad 720p FaceTime allegedly HD camera. But what they've got this time is now they've used the neural engine fancy bits of the processor, which mean that the processor is doing image improvements on the fly. So I look a little bit better. And this is similar to what the iPhone and the iPad do with their cameras that even like there is a lot of computational software stuff happening behind the scenes to make you look good. And now this is what is on this camera as well. So if you're on FaceTime calls with your friends and family or Zoom calls with your friends and family and colleagues, then you will have a very slightly nicer camera but it's not because of the camera, it's because of the neural engine thingy underlying it that improves the image quality. Final thing to talk about is what configuration of this you should get. So let's have a look. So I'm gonna talk about price in pounds, which is basically identical to the price in dollars. Now the base model costs 999 pounds or 999 dollars, and you get a 100 pound discount if you're a student. I actually think the base model is completely fine for most people. You could just buy this and you don't need to get any upgrades because a 256 gigabyte SSD is reasonable for most students and for a lot of people. And eight gigabyte RAM is, again, reasonable for the vast majority of people. If you're a pro and you need to run lots of perform, lots of applications that use multi-core stuff and that needs to store a lot of stuff in its RAM, then maybe you want to upgrade to the 16 gig version. But if you're a pro, you probably don't want to get this one unless you're like me and you just want to upgrade every year. 
If you're a pro, you probably want to wait until early next year for the proper 14-inch and 16-inch MacBook Pros to come out, because if you're a pro, then those are going to have even better performance than this, so you probably want to wait for that. And so if you're a student and strapped for cash, then the basic model, the cheapest model of the MacBook Air will be completely fine for you. If I was getting one personally, um, for me, I care a lot about performance and I don't really care about spending money, and so I'd go for the upgrade and I'd actually probably go for the two terabyte SSD as well. It's because I do a lot of work with videos. And so for me, even like one terabyte SSD isn't enough. This one has a one terabyte SSD, which used to be a lot more expensive back in the day. And I often find myself running out of space. So if you do a lot of work with like really huge ass 4K video files, like the files of this video are gonna be like 150 gigabytes in total. If you're that sort of person, then you might wanna upgrade the SSD. But again, if you're that sort of person, you probably don't want one of these as your daily driver because you're probably doing more pro workflowy type things. But long story short, the configuration I would recommend is just the cheapest one. There is a case to be made for upgrading the RAM. Usually I upgrade RAM. Um, this is controversial. Should you stay with eight gigabyte RAM or should you go 16 gigabyte RAM? A lot of people say that you actually don't need to upgrade the RAM. Some people say that you should. I think if you're a student and you're strapped for cash, you probably won't notice the difference between eight gigabytes and 16 gigabytes. But if you can shell out the extra cash, then hey, why not upgrade to 16 gigabytes, especially if you're gonna keep, be keeping this laptop for a very long time. And so the question is, should you buy the 2020 M1 MacBook Air? And my answer is, if you wanna spend $1,000 on a laptop or thereabouts, then you really can't get anything better than this. But as I'm gonna be talking about in my next video, if you can, if you intend to keep this for a very long time, and you want to shell out an extra three, four hundred dollars, then I would consider upgrading to the MacBook Pro instead. And that is what we're going to be talking about in this video over here in the next few days, if it's not out already. So thank you so much for watching. I really hope that was useful. Do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already. And I'll see you next time. Bye bye.